everybody and welcome to my podcast which is Fiber Floss and Fiction. This is Ann P and today is Sunday the 15th of December 2019. So just about two weeks left in the year if you can believe that this year has gone so fast. Uh, I'm here to do my usual two-week update. Please forgive the sort of stuffiness. I have been fighting off something for almost two weeks now, really ready for it to go away. I'm much better today, a lot less coughing, less congested if you can believe it, and I thought I better get this done because I think this is going to be my last podcast of 2019. Um, we've got some family things happening between Christmas and the end of the year, so I don't think I will be back to talk with you all until um, after the first of the year when we're in the next decade of 2020. So popping in today to shoot my video, slightly different spot, um, just trying to be out of the traffic pattern. My husband's got a bunch of stuff he's working on out in the main room, but uh, I don't think uh, we'll hear much in here. My little lair that is half his room, half my room, uh, kind of eclectic decor, but uh, good light, so hopefully I'll be able to show off stuff easily for everybody to see. If you're a new viewer, welcome. I hope that you have a reason to come back and subscribe and visit with me not only today but in the future. And if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. I always welcome your chit chat, feedback, comments, thumbs ups, all that good stuff. So. Glad to have you with me today. Um, we're going to kick things off and talk a little bit about knitting first, like we usually do. First off, um, just a notice that if you have signed up for the first installment of my Knitter's Journey Club through my online store, which is Wooly Wonka Fibers, I have one more batch of boxes to ship uh, this week, and then those will all be caught up with current orders. Um, my plan is to film the uh, intro, kind of get, getting you started videos tomorrow now that I have a voice back. So those should be up this week as well and you should be ready to start for January 1st when the club officially kicks off. If you are not a club member and want to know more about what fun things we'll be doing this upcoming year in 2020, I'm going to leave a link below to my website. <coughs> Excuse me, and you can take a look at the club section there and read all the details. Lots of fun things kind of coming down the pike there. I'm really looking forward to having a kind of more interactive club this year, so hopefully you are excited about that too if you are interested in joining in on that. Next up, the Epic Project, which if you've been following me for a while and follow me on Instagram, is this large full-length beaded dress that I'm knitting for the runway at Stitches West. I am very happy to say that the skirt is completely done. The only thing that I have left to do is just a little bit of finishing, um, you know, like weaving in ends, that kind of thing. Uh, I have been busily working on the bodice and I have gotten this finished up to uh, where I'm going to join the sleeves on. Um, they're just little short sleeves because it's got a big portrait type collar. So uh, this is where that is. And you can see I have finally reached the lightest color of the alpaca lin that I'm using for this. Um, it's a super, super lightweight yarn. It's got um, the baby alpaca that gives it kind of that halo and then a nice strong linen core. Really, really have enjoyed working with this yarn. Um, so I will have this on the runway. I did not bring the skirt to show you all today because frankly it's so massive that it's, I couldn't have shown it to you like in this little screen here. Um, <coughs> it's going to be, I think, really, really striking on the runway when the lights hit it because it's got so many beads on it. But anyway, it will not be a pattern for this garment, but I will have a 
sweater pattern that's more reasonable to knit as well as a pair of gauntlet style mitts and a shawl that will utilize the same um, yarn and bead combination that you see there in that sample. They'll just be ready wear, if you will. Okay, next up, Christmas socks. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get these finished for Christmas, but we'll have them for the new year. Uh, this is a self-striping sock yarn from Desert Vista Dye Works. Here's her uh, label. This is her Viso sock, which is 75% superwash merino and 25% nylon. Um, she focuses mostly, like 90 plus percent, on self-striping colorways. And this one is Mint Cocoa Quilt. And I have finished sock one. You might remember that I did, I opted to do the heels in this kind of eggnog color that I dyed up and I opted to do the toe as well in that because I thought that kind of went together. Um, and I have started sock two. <laughs> so my plan is to have these for, you know, travel or sitting around in the evening watching Christmas movies with the family kind of thing. They're easy to work on and very straightforward and don't take up a lot of space. So no specific goals or time frame on this, uh, but I'll work on them as I have time over the next couple of weeks into probably the new year. Okay, so knitting, that was quick. I'm gonna try to keep this fairly short today, y'all, because I know everybody is busy during the holiday seasons. Um, so let's move on to reading and books. I have finished two books in the last couple of weeks, and they were both books that I finished up extra credit reading tasks for the School of Magical Stitches and Literature. The first is called Days of Blood and Starlight. It is by Lainey Taylor, and this is part two of a three book series. Uh, I read the first book, um, <laughs> Daughter of Bone and Blood, I think it is. Um, I'll look it up and I'll put the first book um, link down below as well as this book which is Days of Blood and Starlight. Um, this is a young adult fantasy. It is set in a fantasy world, but also uh, kind of scooches over into our universe, our human universe. The main character is um, someone who had been brought up by, for lack of a better word, monsters. Um, she doesn't perceive them as monsters. She understands that they look different than she does, but she doesn't think of them as creepy or uh, scary necessarily because they're they're sort of her foster family. And that was explained all in book one. This is in book two where she has lost these foster parents and she realizes that she is basically a an integral part of this long time battle between the seraphim or these powerful angels and the chimera, the monster-like creatures who have half-human, half-animal body parts or a mixture of animal parts. Um, they're not what we would think of as looking like traditional animals. Um, so this continues that story and um, she has left the angel with whom she had been in love with um, has sort of abandoned him and he, her to some extent. And she is now working as a resurrectionist where she is taking the souls of other chimera who have died in the war, whose souls have been collected off the battlefields and she is re rebuilding bodies for them. Um, stronger, powerful, ones with more wings, ones with more strength, ones with more scary bits added to them. Um, and she comes to be kind of the right-hand person of the White Wolf, who's basically their general. And they're camped out in this uh, desolate desert area here on Earth. Um, and she's busy rebuilding bodies, basically, for the war. 
Um, if you read the first book, uh, I think you would also like this one. I really enjoyed it. It's grittier. It's definitely, um, not that the first one was like all light and fairy tale, but this one definitely is, is grittier. There's more uh, sort of war scenes. There's a lot of, um, uh, descriptions about how she's going about resurrecting these bodies. Um, and the book mostly focuses on her, although we do, uh, the angel that she had fallen in love with, he does come back into the story, uh, and we get some of his perspective on the war between these two battling groups, um, from his perspective as well as hers. <coughs> um, definitely leaves the ending open so I'm assuming book three ties up all of the loose ends um, but yeah another good one I really enjoy this author's writing I appreciate the fact that she's very creative with her world building I like the characters that she creates um, I had a little bit of trouble getting into this book at the front end uh, I think it had been too long since I had read the first one and I probably should have reread it and then tackled this one uh, but once I got myself back up to speed, I devoured this book. I think it was like a two day read for me. So really good and um, enjoying that, that whole series. <clears throat> the next book that I read is called The Black Count and it's by Tom Rice. Again, I will put links to all of these books uh, down below in the comment box if you're interested in reading them for yourself. So The Black Count is a biography slash history book. There's a lot of history that that is written in this book. I think the author opted to do that because there's probably not a lot of primary sources available on the main character that he is writing on, this Black Count. <coughs> so the Black Count is the father of the writer Alexander Dumas who wrote Count of Monte Cristo, who wrote The Three Musketeers, a um, bunch of other sort of classics that you probably would recognize. And the Black Count is his father, who basically was the real Count of Monte Cristo. Very interesting story, which I did not know. Um, he, the Black Count, who's, who went by Alex Dumas, uh, was the uh, son of a French uh, count and a black slave in what is now Haiti. Uh, really interesting kind of family history. Uh, the, the family uh, that were the French landowners had three sons. Um, the oldest son who was set to inherit uh, the estate, the middle son who leaves and goes to Haiti uh, and marries a very well-to-do planter's daughter and becomes a sugar plantation owner himself. And the youngest son, who um, he is definitely the spare, he doesn't seem to have a lot of history incorporated in this, and he dies fairly young. He's, he's in his early 20s when he, he dies of a fever. <coughs> the middle son has gone to what is Saint Domingue to... Um, basically make his money and he becomes very rich and his older brother who's the heir to the estate shows up in Haiti kind of doesn't have anything going on in his life he hasn't inherited yet he doesn't have a trade he doesn't he can't really disengage himself from the estate <coughs> excuse me sorry you guys and he comes to visit his this middle brother and is just going to stay a couple of weeks to see the plantation and he winds up staying for years and years and years and mooching off of his younger brother. <coughs> I'll be right back. Hang on one second. Sorry about that. I uh, went and got some tea, so hopefully that will <clears throat> help keep the coffees down. Anyway, so the older brother has been staying with the middle brother. Um, the middle brother has basically, even though he's making a lot of money, he winds up becoming bankrupt uh, because he's living this very profligate life where they're definitely more cash out than cash in. And the older brother <clears throat> decides that he's going to steal three slaves and he takes the slaves and he 
absconds in the middle of the night with them to this uh, area of Haiti that is not very well uh, developed. It's a place where a lot of the outlaws are living, escaped slaves go to live, and he goes and lives there and sets up a coffee growing establishment, very small, with these three slaves, and he winds up uh, taking one of the female slaves as his mistress, and they have four kids, four children together. <clears throat> He's not heard from, from for years and years, and so the middle brother goes back to France and says, my older brother is dead, we haven't heard from him, you know, he's a ne'er-do-well, and he basically gets set up as the heir to this French estate. He winds up trying to make a great marriage for his, his daughter, he's got the estate in France kind of supporting the plantation in Haiti, um, again, kind of overspending everything that he has coming in, um, which was a lot, but he's managing to spend all of it and then some. All of a sudden, the older brother shows back up again and he says, I am the rightful heir, here's my birth certificate, and I am the heir to this estate. Um, legal battle ensues, he kicks the, the middle brother out, the younger, youngest brother has now since died, um, and he establishes himself back as the heir of this estate. He's brought with him the one boy child of the four children that he had um, with his mistress in Haiti, who is uh, calling himself Alexander Dumas. He's 12. And uh, the eldest um, landowner is not treating him as a slave. He's brought him into French civilization as his son and as, as befits the son of uh, a well-to-do French aristocrat. He is taught to speak multiple languages. He is taught fencing. He goes to dancing school. He cuts a very fine figure. He's well-dressed. Um, he basically gets the same education he would have gotten if he had grown up from an infant in, in French society. And all of this is taking place uh, in the late 18th century, so around the time of the American Revolution and what will be becoming the French Revolution. <clears throat> There are some other legal things that happen, but basically what winds up going on is the daughter of the middle brother um, still feels that she has a claim. Uh, her father is now dead. She feels that she has a claim as the rightful heir to this estate. So she and her husband, who is another French aristocrat, basically buy out the eldest brother's title. They give him a flat fee, uh, very... Uh, in-depth amount of money plus an annual stipend. So the eldest brother and Alex, Alex Dumas move to Paris where they are um, very socially involved. Um, they do all the things that you would expect a French aristocrat to do they, and they burn through a lot of money. Uh, Alex Dumas's father then dies and he is left to figure out what he's going to do with his life since they have basically said we don't want the title anymore. His father had given that up. So he does what many young men in the time did and goes into the army where all of the things that he learned as a nobleman's son uh, come into really moving him up through the ranks very quickly. He enlists as a common soldier but he's got these great skills like he can ride a horse uh, like nobody's business and he's got amazing sword skills and he's also a very striking figure. Um, he has fairly dark skin, he's 6'1", he's very well built and um, kind of stands out in a crowd and he also apparently has almost reckless courage where he will fight duels and he leads his men into battle without a care in the world it seems um, and so works his way up through the ranks. So the book is told ab about his military career, um, 
eventually, of course, the French Revolution comes and he is all for, you know, the, the people in the support of the people. So he is tasked with multiple military uh, campaigns. He winds up uh, taking many French towns as well as some along the Alpine borders. He's renowned for his bravery, his men love him, um, seems like kind of the sky's the limit. And so one of the interesting things that this book talks about is the fact that in the early years of the French Revolution, um, the, the men and women who either had come from a French holding like one of the islands or were um, brought to France as slaves and then perhaps manumitted by their owners, people of color were allowed to have much uh, greater freedoms in France as part of the sort of movement towards um, the people ruling. Um, and certainly somebody with great skills who was charming and well-read and well-spoken could advance very highly, uh, which is exactly what Alex Dumas did is he uh, you know, worked his way up through the military and was very well respected and uh, had numbers of commendations. By the end of the French Revolution uh, and when Napoleon came to power, however, Napoleon was very anti, uh, anti anybody who wasn't him, basically. Um, you know, he kind of wanted to go back to the concept that white men only should be property owners, that uh, only white men should have a say in the government. And this was not just about uh, skin color, it was also that he felt that women should not have a place uh, to have a say in the government or in ruling their households or in any of those things. So it was kind of multiple backward steps and he, he uh, Napoleon and Alex Dumas had been uh, at the same level in the military until Napoleon uh, became emperor and kind of took over control as a ruling figure in France. And they, the two men did not like each other at all. They were constantly in disagreements about how to affect things with the population, how to best run a military campaign and all of those things. So by the age of 40, um, General Dumas is without a pension. He's been imprisoned for two years for reasons he can't fathom. Um, he's finally gotten allowed uh, freedom to go home to visit his family and uh, he winds up dying at home at the age of 40. They, they are fairly sure he had stomach cancer and it could have been brought on as um, kind of the fallout from being someone attempted to poison him while he was in incarcerated. So a lot of the storyline for the Count of Monte Cristo that his son, uh, the writer, Alexandre Dumas, put into that story uh, parallels a lot of things in his father's life where he's unjustly imprisoned and he wants to exact revenge and he is a cultured man who um, by the virtue of his charm, his charisma, um, his amazing dueling skills can rise up through the ranks uh, and achieve uh, not only wealth and power, but also uh, exact revenge on the people who had unjustly accused him of many things. So it's an interesting read. Um, like I said, I think that it, it doesn't have as much primary source material as the author probably should have had because there's some things that he kind of has to fill in with history, um, but it was a very interesting book because I was really unaware that this level of equality existed in the French Revolution for um, people of color to have a reason, a reasonable expectation that they could advance themselves by skill and um, just who, who their personal character was stood them in good stead. Um, I didn't know the story, the backstory of Dumas's father's life. I had never heard of this general, although obviously he was an integral part of the French Revolution. 
Uh, so an interesting read, and if you're if you like that kind of uh, sort of small tidbit of history, my guess is you'll enjoy reading that book. It's definitely a historian type book. It's a little dry. There are some sections that you uh, would like him to get to the point a little quicker. Uh, so it's not like an adventure tale, but there's so many interesting things about this particular person's life that I think you can kind of overlook that and skim where you need to, but still um, find out about somebody interesting uh, that most people, I would guess, have never even heard of. Uh, so just as a high level thing, um, that gets me to 84 books this year. I think I have a couple that I will have finished, have finished by the end of uh, 2019. Um, I'm currently reading The Princes of Ireland by Edward Rutherford uh, in an audiobook. Plan to have that done by the end of the year. I've got like eight hours left on that. And then I'm also reading um, another history book called If Walls Could Talk by Lucy Wor Worsley. Uh, I think if you live in the UK, you maybe are overly... Uh, are over her. I understand she has a lot of programs out and maybe has more exposure than she needs to have, but here in the US we do not have that and I do enjoy her writing. Um, this is all about kind of each room in the house and how it has developed over time, um, like the development of indoor plumbing, how that influenced bathrooms, and why closets are closets, and things that went on in the kitchen, and all that kind of stuff. So a fun read. Um, she's, if you are interested in history but don't normally like history books, I think hers are good reads. Uh, they're pretty quick reads, they're mostly anecdotal, they're pretty light and upbeat. Um, the chapters tend to be short and while you do get good history from it, it's not a weighty tome to read. So, um, recommending this one, uh, about halfway done it and just going to keep on going until it's finished. All right, next up, let's talk about cross stitch. <coughs> um, I do have one finish and that is my village of Hawk Run Hollow. I'm going to, um, pause me talking and I'm going to insert a short video that's going to give you guys a quick tour through that. I don't have the piece here because it's off being framed, but uh, we'll show that you know finished version once it is framed. So for now, go ahead and take a quick look at my walkthrough video of Village of Hawk Run Hollow. Hey everybody, so this is my finished video to talk to you about my Village of Hawk Run Hollow piece. Here you can see the whole thing. So hopefully you enjoyed that tour. Um, I'm excited to have that finished. That was not a planned finish for this year. I thought pretty strongly that I would still have the bottom three blocks to finish in 2020, but I'm super happy that I got that done. It's a huge piece. So um, yeah, I was, I was just really happy to have that off my to-do list for the year uh, for next year so I can slot something else in. So let's talk about what I've been working on in the last couple of weeks. Um, let's go here first. Uh, working on a project for uh, Magical Stitches in Literature, which I kind of can't believe is almost coming to an end. It's been such an amazing year. Um, I put in some stitches on my Summer Schoolhouse 1. This is a pattern by uh, With Thy Needle and Thread, uh, Brenda Gervais. And there's a whole series of these. There's a set of four plus a few other accessories. And they're uh, meant, to be, meant to be stitched over one. So I am doing that and I'm gonna make little cushions out of all of them. Uh, stitching this one over one on a 28 count Monaco using a mix of color and cotton and gentle arch threads. So I added, uh, I finished up this first row of the house except for those couple little stitches and then I started on the window and then I also came up here and I worked on the vine that the bird is holding. So that's this part right there. Just a couple hundred stitches so nothing major but you know progress on that is always good and that one's going on to my um, plans for 20 finishes in 2020. 
if you'd like to join me with that, uh, hashtag uh, stitch20 in 20. And um, I'd love to see your progress on Instagram and Facebook. I've got 12 small things earmarked. And then I'm looking at page finishes and uh, at least one larger finish to fill out my other eight projects. Uh, I'll have more discussion about that in 2020 when it comes. So in a couple of weeks, we can talk about that some more. Um, but just at a high level, if you're interested, I would love to have you join me. Okay, next, um, I also worked on two drawn thread projects. The first of which is Welcome Winter by the John Thread. Um, <coughs> right now, I'm working this on a scrap of a 32 count, I think it's called Smoky Pearl. It's um, a Zweig Art Linen. I did my John Thread Winter Garden on it, the larger piece of this last year. So I just have a little scrap that I'm working this on. <coughs> so I added the, uh, worked on the letters this time. And stitching this all in color and cotton as a conversion, color and cotton floss. Uh, so you'll see that one again next year. That's also on the Stitch 20 and 20 finish, finish list. <coughs> I know it's hard to believe that this is better, but this is better. This one has just gone on and on and on, and I sort of think it's the flu, but I'm pretending it's not since I got a flu shot this year. And you know, you hate to get a shot for something that's not going to be helping you. Anyway, uh, the next one is Welcome Spring, also by the John Thread. So I have Welcome Fall and Welcome Summer done. So these are the last two in this series and um, doing them all as little uh, rectangular type pillow ornaments and not framing these. So I worked on letters again. This is the center part of this one. This is the, there's a, a lily I think is what this is here in the center or maybe daffodil probably daffodil. Anyway, something stylized and yellow. Um, so again, I'm working this uh, with color and cotton hand dyed floss. And this is a 28 count Monaco. I think antique white. So you'll see both of those out again in 2020. <coughs> um, I also worked on a long winter's nap ornament charted by heaven and earth and artwork by Donna Gelsinger because I was in the mood for some Christmassy things and this is for the full coverage fanatics December sal which is welcome winter to stitch on anything that's winter themed which I thought this was great for so I had finished this page earlier this year and I started work on this page this is basically this section of his torso. You can see the one button there and it's there. And then I'm working on getting that page finished up. I am just over the halfway point on this page and I'll be working on this a little bit this week uh, for Magical Stitches homework. Um, nothing crazy and I'm not thinking I'm gonna get a page finish on this this, this month. Um, which is fine because I will have it to finish next year and I know I can get that done. Um, but yeah, really enjoying this one. There's a lot less confetti in this than there are in the Amy Stewart pieces. Uh, so it was a nice little break to work on some full coverage that was not quite as crazy confetti. Then this weekend, since again, I am in, have been interested in seasonal things. Um, I forgot to bring the picture up with me, uh, but you guys can kind of get get the gist. Uh, this is Joan Elliott's Winter Fairy. <coughs> and I am stitching this on a 28 count even weave. It was the July 2017 Fabric of the Month Club from Color and Cotton. 
but doesn't have a colorway name. She may have similar things in her shop, um, but, I, but I think she's called it something else if she does. So I am working on this using the call for threads, stitching two threads over two strands of floss over two threads of the even weave. Um, I'm mostly filling this in as I go. I'm not doing the beads at the front end. You can see there's some space left there for the necklace that she has on that are little pearls. And there's some kind of swirled um, seed pearls in the sky there around her. <coughs> But I'm going to be working on this this week and see how far I get. I'm going to probably also work on this later this afternoon and just put some stitches in. Uh, one thing that I am starting, which started today, is a challenge with the Semi Sane Stitchers group, which is mapping your literary journey, which I think is going to be really fun. Uh, so you take, you have, can do up to 20 books and you take each chapter and for every page in the chapter, you multiply that by 25. And so I'm actually using this book as my first book and I've broken all the chapters out um, so I know how many stitches kind of I need to batch together. And there's a total of 7,815 stitches. So I'm gonna apply the, the stitches I work on that today to that particular challenge and get that one kicked off a little bit early for 2020. Uh, they opted to open it, I think, half a month early since there's a lot of folks who take time off at the end of the month and that'll be a good excuse to put your stitches towards something. Uh, last but not least I wanted to share with you um, my fabric purchase. Uh, these are hand dyed hand painted fabrics. Uh, fabrics by Catherine and they're exclusive only through 1884 Stitchery. I will put a link down below but um, McKenna uh, Stitching in Sequins owns that shop and they're all one of a kind. There are some that are kind of similar but they're all one of a kind so I grabbed the ones I loved even if I wasn't 100% sure what I was going to do with them. There's this one <clears throat> which I think would be really pretty with one of the smaller pretty ladies on it kind of in this section right here. <coughs> there is this one. And if I can get it to fit, I may do Halloween Fairy on this, um, the Nora Corbett one for next year. But we'll see, I need to measure and make sure. But I think that would be fun because there are some stitched pumpkins in that one and I thought it might be kind of fun to have her in between the painted pumpkins. Um, we'll see if I can, can get it to fit height wise. If not, that's, that's okay. I will find something else to do with it. This falling leaves one. And I was thinking this might be, um, suitable for, uh, either some Halloween type ornaments or possibly even in ink circles, but I haven't decided for sure yet on that one. And then this one, which I love has a, sort of a parchment feel to it and then inked words on it. And I have a um, book of spells, a Halloween themed piece uh, from The Primitive Hair. That's the front cover and it's all done in black and uh, it's got like spell names and things on it and I wanna put that for sure on this one. So I think McKenna does have some still left, um, but if you, if you love any of these, I would say toddle on over there and grab yourself something as a Christmas present to yourself, holiday present to yourself, because um, she doesn't have a ton left, and since they're all one of a kind, if there's something that you love and see, I would say grab it, because I'm not sure. I, I think the plan is for her to get more, but I don't know that for sure, so don't quote me on that. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> I think that's about it. Uh, like I said, I'll have more plans coming up uh, when I do my January video. That'll probably be a longer one because we'll be discussing th some things going forward for uh, 2020. Uh, Magical Stitches and Literature is finishing up their Harry Potter year. I am not going to be doing the Disney year with them. I've opted to do a few other things. Uh, we have a ton of, 
uh, challenges in full coverage fanatics if you like full coverage. Um, also links down below for those uh, Facebook groups and I've also got a bunch of things from Semi Sane Stitchers. There's a brand new uh, group out that's Mythological Stitcher Challenge, I think is what it's called. Again, I'll link it below. Uh, anyway, lots of stuff going on in 2020 that I'm super excited about. Um, I'm really looking forward to kicking off the new decade and um, having a bunch of crafty, stitchy time in 2020 uh, moving forward. So. I wish you all, um, both new and old viewers, the very best of the holiday season. I hope that you have a little bit of time off to relax, spend time with family or friends, certainly have time to spend with your crafting. Um, if you are planning on doing a new year, new start, uh, I hope you enjoy that. And I know I'll be kicking off the uh, beginning of 2020 with the Amy Stewart Once Upon a Fairy Tale. Uh, project that I'll be starting on the second when I'm back at home and relaxing and all that good stuff. Um, I hope that the joy of the season brings you lots of good cheer, um, good health, um, and fun things to think about for the upcoming year in 2020. So I will talk to you all next year. Um, until then, everybody take care and enjoy the holidays. Bye for now.